in the Republic by Plato, Plato tries to understand what it is to be a just person. Uh, and the psyche is, of course, very hard. And so what he does is he blows it up and he creates a corresponding model of the Republic, hence the name of the book, a, a city. And by having that larger picture that's external to our own identity, we can get a, diff a, a better idea of justice. And then what we can do is move back and forth between uh, the justice of the psyche and the justice of, uh, of the city. And that actually affords our transformation in a process that he calls the ascent of pedagogy. Now, I think that is a terrific way to go about it. And I think actually people have been working this way with respect to spirits, hyper objects, principalities and powers, this, this middle realm. I, I've spoken before that part of what happened in, in missiology is that missionaries went from the developed West to much of the rest of the world. And Hyber, I believe that's his name, I'm, I'm not pulling up the material for us right now, uh, talked about the excluded middle. And, and this is very much what we're talking about here. And in missiological terms, when they would go to Africa or Asia or Latin America, many of these places outside of Christendom, you would have, you would have a middle realm which were filled with these spirits, entities, so on and so forth. The West believed, well, we didn't have that, but we had a middle realm filmed, filled with all sorts of other things. And in a sense, what Hyper Objects does is, is begin to bring those things, help us to see the middle realms in the West. And now we're starting to understand a little bit of what the rest of the world saw. Well, you can have temporal meaning. It doesn't need to, you know, just because a story ends, it doesn't mean that the story isn't meaningful. Of course, when a story ends, there's still a world outside of the story in which the meaning can be ascertained and, and, in, and in which you can sort of uh, interact with that meaning and experience that meaning. If the, if the story ends, and so does the person who read it, and so does everybody else who's ever going to read it, then I, I, I think... Um, was it Pascal who talked about how everything is obliterated in the presence of the infinite? It doesn't matter if your life is one year or five years. It doesn't matter if it's got a little bit of meaning or a lot of meaning. If, if you have this infinite eternity of non-existence awaiting you, everything just collapses in the face of it and becomes, uh, if not negligibly small, then, then impossibly small. It sort of reduces to a, a singularity of, 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 of nothingness. So uh, let me make sure I'm understanding you correctly. The idea is that when we're talking about this connectedness, we're all we're talking about uh, the con uh, the a connection to a world that itself never ends, or something like that. Because you said it doesn't matter if I personally die, as long as the meaning I've made gets carried picked up by other people or the world or something like that. Is that well? The I, case? I think it. Pers I personally think that it does, but but I understand that some people might like to say, well, I know that I'm going to die, but I can do things that are going to outlive me, and that's where I find my meaning. But of course that yeah. all will come to an end as well. And I, I think that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, you, I, it, you, you won't need me to explain to you why it is that people will, will consider the fact that they're going to die and that seemingly the universe is going to end and everyone they know is going to die, everyone that could exist is going to die, and that somehow undermines a sense of meaning. You, you, I mean, you'll, you'll understand that that's a, a common thing that people think. I'm yeah, just wondering if yeah. you can reflect on that for us. I do. And what I would say is, like, again, um, I think trying to bind meaning in that way ultimately makes the connection purely instrumental in nature. And I would say to you, you know, what makes a moral act meaningful is that, you know, human beings are intrinsically valuable. Um, and there are things that there are states that are intrinsically valuable. Realizing enlightenment for the Buddhist is intrinsically valuable, it doesn't need to persist for that intrinsic value to go on. In fact, to I mean, the problem with making an instrumental is it's doomed to fail because I keep deferring what is ultimately the final thing that retroactively converts all the meaning on everything. And then I ask you, well, why does, let, let's say it went the other way, right? It would, right? You, you know, and whether or not there's going to be heat death is now controversial, of course. Uh, you know, and the, it's like, well, why does that convey meaning all the way back? You know, I have, I won't ever experience that. That's a, that, that, that's, that, that, that will have no impact on me. And so I, I, I want to say that, 
you know, people want to be bound to things that they consider to have an intrinsic value, not an instrumental value. And if you ask me, well, why should we consider things to have intrinsic value? I, that's for me, that's just constitutive of being an agent. Um, if you, if you're not capable of finding agency intrinsically valuable, then you're not a self-making self. Like, look, we only care about information, this information rather than that information, because we're perpetually taking care of ourselves. That's constitutive of us. We have to find our own agency intrinsically valuable. And of course, I think we should find other agency intrinsically valuable. And so I, I think the, I would worry about trying to slip this into an, uh, a, a endlessly deferred instrumental framing. I would want to say, no, no, if I can get connected to the things that have an, uh, an intrinsic value and there's something sort of eternal about that because they're not, their value isn't contingently, temporally, spatially bound, right? Then that's what gives me that kind of meaning that I'm talking about. But I mean, you can you can imagine somebody just sort of rejecting the premise. I mean, I don't really want to get into the, the issue of objectivity and value because I think that would take up too much space. And although it's it's relevant, it would be a bit of a detour. Uh, but 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 in other words, uh, you know, so somebody can say, well, of of course, I run into problems uh, if I if I just uh, accept this worldview that that there is no value outside of the instrumental. But if that's just what they believe, that's just if that's just what they think is the case. I mean, I, I I'm trying to prevent against like begging the question in favor of meaning. So I say, well, doesn't this thing preclude meaning? And it, it sounds like you're saying, well, if you think in this way, then you essentially preclude the ability for meaning. That, that's the very thing that we're discussing here. I mean, I don't understand how it can be that somebody can. I, I mean, you you spoke a moment ago about how the the heat death isn't relevant to you. So why would the the badness of this heat death why would that affect your sense of meaning? Because you're not going to experience it. Well, yeah, it's symmetrical. The argument in, is, in, right? If, if, if I can have no impact on it, why should have it? Why should it have an impact on me? It's a symmetrical argument. Yeah. Well, I, I think the problem is that if if somebody, I mean, it can it can affect you now in the sense that you know it's going to happen. So, for example, if you decided that you wanted to uh, write a poem or write a magnum opus. In order to, um, uh, the, the terror management theorists would have it that you're essentially doing this in order to escape your death, but maybe you're mm -hmm. doing it for this sense of meaning. And part of the reason for that is, and I think there's some truth in this, in that like, if you were sort of casually working on a really important book that you wanted to get out at some point, and then you found out you were going to die next week, it would probably drastically increase your motivation to get it out. And that might have something to do with the fact that knowledge of impending death motivates uh, our desire to create meaningful things, implying maybe that the the meaning that we're that we're trying to gain here is got something to do with escaping death. Now, my knowledge of this heat death of the universe, it doesn't affect me in the sense I'm never going to experience the heat death. But I know that this poem that I write or this book that I produce, sure, it's going to outlive me, but it's still going to die in this heat death. And so, yeah, I'm not going to directly experience it, but it still bears on the relevance of the meaning of what I do while I'm alive today, if you see what I mean. This is stupid, but like God's making a bunch of cookies for all of us, right? And he's like, uh, I can handle this, no big deal. But instead of saying, I can handle this, no big deal, he says, all right, you can come over here and mix the bowl if you like. And then you can take the fork and press it in the cookies so it has a cool little ridges on there. Meanwhile, I'm pressing the fork in there with the, uh, and the cookie thinking, I'm doing something and I'm making a difference. And if I didn't do this, like if I didn't make, make, press this fork into this cookie, this cookie wouldn't exist. And so it's like, no, the cookie already exists. It's all good. I get to participate in it. And he gives me the joy and, and the mercy to be able to part, you know, participate in the process of, of helping to prepare the cookies. You know, and it's, it's silly, but like, why couldn't it be that? You know, meanwhile, yeah. Yeah. It's it, there. There's like this. Yeah, there's this. It, it's, it's like it's it, there is this sense that like I remember like when I was when I first started making music and like I'd follow like different artists. And it's like I'll die, but my music will last forever. You know what I mean? Like, they, yeah, yeah. And like, that's a very much like an artist thing. Right. It is like, oh, but the, the impact I'll have or whatever, especially like being like 
a millennial and, and kind of being raised with like whatever the your special thing and like and like you know uh, delusions of grandeur or whatever and what's that i was just saying like hendrix morrison yeah Kobe, all, all of them nailed yeah. this yeah eminem tupac yep all of them were, all of them said stuff like that and like the truth is is that like and i i, I even have a song about this um but it'll it'll all be gone no matter who you are like it won't eventually they won't care like i bet you like maybe hendrix is still like like cool to it gen z but i bet you like i bet you like we'd be surprised how few like everybody's still got a lot of respect for the 70s and 70s rock but like the beatles i think the beatles have lost i like the beatles but they've lost a lot of clout in the in this generation they don't care as much and like it's just the it's just kind of this reality of like you 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 want to make your mark on the wall you're not really ever going to not not the way not not in such a lasting way like it's all sandcastles man and the, and the water come the tide comes in eventually and washes it away no matter what it is it's it's the spirit of self-love and i think it's also the spirit of judas <clears throat> um, because like i think i think that's that kind of spirit where it's like uh uh, the self-love thing drives me up the walls because yeah. it's a total distraction from what my duties are what i say my the, the what i what i believe my duties are in this world right so if i put if i put self-love up here like um and that's the highest that i need to care for myself and make sure that i'm you know all like happy and healthy all this shit like what you know and I'm going against the laws again, man. Like, I'm going to be so focused on this, I can't actually be useful. And so, and then, like, the Judas thing where, you know, like, he, you know, he's jealous. I think he's partly jealous. And he's upset that Christ isn't doing what he thinks he, that he should do. And, you know, like, he thought, I, I bet you he thought what he was doing with Christ was a good thing. This guy's an asshole. He needs to get out of here. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go tell those people, right? And he was blinded by by his self interests and like, yeah. I mean, this is why. Like, I, I've thought about suicide in the past, and um, and actually, before, like, r- recently, be- right before my um, like being captured by Christ, uh, I I was feeling like um, I started doing some. I don't know. It was it was placed upon me to to reflect on this idea that I had been inhabiting the spirit of Judas for a very long time. Because um, I, he, you know, I, I I I thought of suicide a lot in my life, and I thought of all this kind of self propelling um, uh, motion and love and life and and make it about me and um, you know, it, it, it's just it's it's so blinding, dude. You know and uh one thing I, I was thinking about with with people who who do kill themselves one of the one of the things that i was thinking about a long time ago when i was having these thoughts was if i if i find a way to do this that doesn't necessarily look like uh like i did it on purpose these people will remember me forever like all the people that i'm close with and most of those people i don't even talk to anymore so like and then the other people I've seen in my life who have committed suicide, uh, I hate to say it, but like except for those most close to them, nobody talks about them. Nobody remembers them until maybe the next person does it. They're like, "Oh yeah, remember such and such that killed themselves." It's like it sucks, dude. But like that's the blinding of the self love. And then like if self love is the god and I can't seem to reach it like that's where despair comes from yeah before i go on stage i pray and i ask for courage and strength and it comes to me Mm -hmm. and i go out on stage and i'm not afraid yeah even if i forget what i was going to say i'm not afraid yeah because i don't know how that works well no you constantly (laughs) linked yourself to the source and that's what it is 
that's why I mean I begin every day with a holy hour, and mm, especially yeah. now as a, as a bishop, and I've got my word on fire responsibilities and lots of other things. Is my life is kind of go go, and I'm running all over the place and getting on airplanes and all that. Mm -hmm. So if I don't do that, if I don't begin the day with a full hour of uselessness, then then I'm um, I'm going to be lost, you know. So prayer is useless. I mean, it's, it's not for anything else. No, <laughs> it's that's just right. for its own sake. Yeah. But then it does indeed have that effect because it it will connect you to the divine source and thereby give you powers and energies that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, I find that when I, sometimes when I'm praying the rosary, and I pray the rosary not in our house, but in the porch, and mm -hmm. the porch is surrounded by stained glass. Hmm. So I can see outside. Yeah. I can see the world. Yeah. But I am there sitting on my couch that has a sheepskin and some of my drawings that are behind. It's my, my place. I have it's a candle and I have my place, rosary yeah. there and I can sit. Yeah. And... Um, I pray the rosary and I try to, when I first began, I prayed for each of my family members and whoever else I could think of that took up all the beads on mm -hmm. the rosary. And then since then, I've done more uh, universal prayers. So I'll pray for all the sick and I'll think of my father and I'll think of my sister who are both yeah. maybe a year or two to live. So all those universal dream or all those universal prayers Come down, can come down to the local, and that I never thought of this, but yeah, the local and the spiritual when they meet, something happens. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you're saying a lot there, you know. The uh, <laughs> but the sacred place. Um, mine is over my home. I have a chapel, right? Right. And as mm -hmm. a bishop, I have the privilege of having the Blessed Sacrament in my oh, chapel. Right. Yes. So that's the place I go, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and it's with icons and with different decorations and all that. Mm -hmm. And it's my spot, this chair that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I almost invariably begin with either a decade of the rosary or the Jesus prayer, you know, from oh, the, the Eastern Jesus tradition. Prayer. Yeah. I, Lord Jesus I love Christ, that. Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That makes me humble, that. Right. Repeat it over and over again. You yeah. Know? So I usually begin with that, but that's just a centering exercise uh -huh. you know, to make sure that I'm... I'm grounded, and mm -hmm. I, I just, I try, like, one thing I do, just automatically, the phone stays elsewhere. I, right. I, won't, I won't bring it in there, yeah. because it's just too distracting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, sit in silence and openness. Mm -hmm. And I, it, one thing I love about the rosary, it, it is kind of, it's a total waste of time. You know, it, it, you start here, yes, and you yes. go all the way around, you get back where you started from. Yeah, it, it doesn't right. get you anywhere. Yeah. It's a meditative, contemplative, yeah. Good it's in useless, itself. What you said. You, it's useless. Like you yeah. said, it's useless. No, quite right. The best things in life are useless, and um, <laughs> the so the rosary's like. Life are useless. It's true, though. That, I mean, Aristotle knew that, and he was right about that. that oh, he knew that. Yeah, because um, if it's useful, then it's subordinated to some end beyond itself. And then, okay, what's that? You must finally get to something that's just useless, like watching a baseball game or praying the yeah, rosary yeah. or having a conversation. Jordan Those and are... I went to the baseball game. Oh, really? It was a long time ago in Boston, and he just worked all the time when he was at Harvard, you know, <laughs> yeah. work, 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 and then he'd come home and be with us and then work, work, work. And we'd go to this baseball game, and he goes, wow, like this is boring. Right. But... And then he said, oh, I guess that's what it's all about. <laughs> yes. Well, I was taught as a kid, my father must have taught me this, we went to the Cubs games at Wrigley Field, famous baseball stadium, right? Mm -hmm old-fashioned baseball stadium. Beautiful. So the stadium itself is mm. very beautiful. Mm -hmm. But he taught me how to keep score. And so when you, you, know, you have the scorecard and then the batters yeah. come up and you, you have this notation system yes. to remember, okay, well, how many strikes and balls and they get the first base and all this stuff. Yeah. And then you, you finish. You do the whole game, right? And what that does is it keeps your mind in the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It keeps your yes, mind in the game. You. you can wander yeah. around and you start thinking about your life and you're worried about this and that. No, the keeping score keeps you in the game. But, like, I never save those things. Once the game's over, it's right. like, okay, you know, throw it away. Right, right. Because it, its purpose, it was a contemplative exercise. Mm -hmm. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. It was a contemplative exercise meant to ground you in this useless activity of watching a baseball game. And the fact that baseball, I mean, everyone's commented on this, is so leisurely. and it it's is. so It's such a waste of time. And, and um, <laughs> But, you know, the amazing thing is that baseball games from the late 19th century to today, they, they've always ended. And without a clock. Every other sport has a clock, you know, mm -hmm. you're counting out. Baseball doesn't. Oh, no, but somehow the, the, you know, the game, game ends. Right? 
Yeah, the game can be four hours four long. Four hours long, yeah. But they eventually end because, you know, people you will know, hit a ground ball and they'll be thrown out. So you just you kind of let the game um, set its own rhythm for you. Yeah. And that's what true of all contemplative exercises. Uh-huh. Uh, mm -hmm. Prayer mm -hmm. par excellence, you know, would mm -hmm. be that, is mm -hmm. you, you turn your life over to, to God. That's why, like, like the rosary or the psalms themselves, which are repetitive. I mean, I don't know how many times I've prayed the 150 psalms now in my life. I started praying the hours when I was probably 21, you know, so mm -hmm. that's 40-some years mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. the same psalms of a practice. over and over again. Yeah. And what do you think that's done for you? Oh, it's done a... It's done the world for me. It's done the world. It's, um, yeah. it's my spiritual life, really, I would say, the Liturgy of the Hours. Because as a priest, it's interesting, you're not obligated to say Mass every day, although typically we do, mm -hmm. you know. But you are obligated to pray the Liturgy of the Hours every day. You mm -hmm. make that promise when you're ordained. Mm. And so it's a very sacred thing. And, you know, there are times when it's the end of the day, oh, I haven't done right. my evening prayer yet, and I'm, I'm tired, or, you know, I'm in a bad mood or something. I don't care. I don't care. You pray it. Because mm. you're not praying it for yourself. You're praying it for the church. Yeah. You know? But I, I like the fact that it gives me this obligation. It, it's an obligation to be useless. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's in, in this life mm -hmm. that's full of obligations to be useful, there's an obligation to be, you must be useless. Mm -hmm. I am not going to let you go to bed with, a, with an entirely useful day. You've got to be useless. You know, so in the morning I do part of the office, mm -hmm. and then in the course of the day I'll do other parts of it. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. You know, when you have time, you put it in. Well, but the point of the liturgy but, of but the you hours. But so you don't sit a whole hour necessarily. No, I, I do part of it in the morning with my holy hour. Okay. But the idea of that, of course, is to sanctify the day. So you're meant to pray mm. it at different times of the day. Right. Something in terms of of the meals, like you should have morning prayer. You know, by, at breakfast, you should have midday prayer around noon. You right. should have evening prayer at dinner and then Compline before you go to bed. Yes. Uh, so that way you, you sanctify the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in uh, Vienna, <clears throat> just outside of Vienna, we went to a monastery, Heligen Kreis. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, for yeah. five weeks, I think, we were there. A very long time. And that's what they, their masses were that many times a day. Yeah. Some of them with chanting and some of them not with chanting. Yeah. That was a glorious time. It was very contemplative time. Well, yeah, those monasteries are powerhouses. I mean, they're yeah. built for that purpose. They're built to be useless. And, uh, you know, or at Labora, the, you, you work and you pray in a monastery. Mm -hmm. But the prayer is that that's the point. That's the high point. You know, prefer nothing to the work of God, says, says the Benedictine rule. We are told the story of his conversion. And, and also, again, a little bit when I heard Neil's experience at the... Um, in the, in the Catholic Church that he describes so well in the uh, conversation with Chad, um, the, the, the Jesus don't want me for a sunbeam, clearly, or he would have come got me by now. Maybe, maybe I've been trying to play for the wrong team this whole time, this whole time. Um, but uh, I am still alive. I'm, uh, I'm not myself anymore. The, the person you've all met, I, I don't get to be him anymore. I have to be this other thing now. And it's a miserable, horrible thing full of hate. And, and uh, I don't know, uh, resentment for being born, really. And I guess, I guess maybe that's, that's something I have to work on. Um, yeah, but yes, I'm still alive. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been able to. I, without the branding, this is so much harder. So much harder. So, but uh, I'm still here and still very grateful that, that uh, for everything that's come these these last four years where I've tried to tried to be tried to think and and talk and share and just process it I, it, it doesn't it doesn't keep the roof over the head <laughs> uh, I don't know I just wanted this I mean people are like 
leaving me messages say, hey man, if you need to talk, uh, I don't, talking doesn't really change much, guys. Hey, Gavin. Hello. 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 I, 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 I've been gone a little bit, which is interesting. You kind of come in and you participate in these conversations. Like, where would you say you're at on like your journey as you're seeking God, thinking about these things? I don't think you would put yourself in the, I don't think you would necessarily identify as, as Christian or where are you at now on your journey? I, uh, I decided to practice uh, serving Jesus as King on October 12th this year. So listen to that. But uh, last night I was, I've been at, I've been at a church a few months before that. Michael Sartori helped me with that. Um, encouraged me. Um, but I was, I was with a, a, it's a big church and they have teams. And so I was talking to like the production team and they can need to do a background check and stuff if I want to serve on the production team. And they ask you yes, no questions on what you believe. And I had done this like two months ago and I only had said one yes, you know, to, but now I had like three yeses, but I still had no's and I'm, they were curious. He said, well, only, what are the ones that you say no for? And so they asked like, do you believe in the virgin birth? I said like this one, it's like, I want to say maybe, or I don't know, but you want me to say yes or no. <laughs> and it's, there's that one. Um, but yeah, and then is the Bible inerrant? You know, I don't really want to say, I like, I, I think Michael said it in scripture. I think it says, uh, God breathed. The scripture is God breathed. Um, but yeah, so they, they want to ask yes, no questions. Meanwhile, um, I can feel like peace and love and joy like I've never felt before. And they're wanting me to like say yes to some creed that some guys made. And I've got trust issues. So I'm getting to where I can trust God. I can trust Jesus. But do I need to trust the Council of Nicaea? Do I need to trust the early church fathers? Like I'm not there yet. Right. So, uh, but yeah, life has been so much better. I've been practicing um, meeting with the, uh, my wife regularly and that was encouraged by chad so i've been talking to chad he that led up to it as well I've, i talked to him like 4 a.m uh almost most days of the week and we pray together and so that happened before that so i've you know i've had a lot of help it's not something i did on my own right um but yeah it's a uh, i had to go from wanting to be king to uh saying that uh jesus uh, would be the best king, right? Saw that whenever the, you know, the artificial intelligence, kind of the capabilities of artificial intelligence opened my eyes back in March. And uh, Chad had got me to, he had said it would be good if it could love people. And I was thinking, well, if we're going to build one, I was thinking we probably should make it look like Jesus. And so that's what, that was the first time I realized, like, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to pick a God, because I know Paul's been talking about uh, Ali and and she was asked to do some kind of exercise to build her own God of her own. Like what kind of God would she build? I was I kind of was led to that because of GPT four and Chad mentioning that it would be good if this thing would love people. And I was like, well, maybe we can make this thing, you know, act like Jesus. It's going to supposedly it can be this very super powerful being. They're actually trying to create a God in this world. These, you know, a lot of godless people are trying to create a God. And it's like, man, they better try to create one like Jesus. Like, it'd be good if they actually thought about this. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> man, that's bad. You have to, uh, you have to, re you have to refer to Chad anonymously next time you talk about his good deeds. Uh, nah, no, but, I mean, every Michael every answered some questions too. Like, he, he, he talked about encouraging people to go to church. And I'm just like, Michael, if you'd never been to church before, you got a child, you got children and a wife. It's like, what's your first step? Like, cause I don't, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to know that I can trust these people with my kids? Right. So, you know, I'd need it very plain and simple about these, you know, basic steps. If you want to go check it out. And then when I go to church, I got to close my eyes because it's all overwhelming. Mm. It's like, if I'm trying to listen to Michael and then you flash these comments up here, I have a hard time listening to Michael. And so I just get distracted. And I have to close my eyes. If I'm in there during a worship service, if I have my eyes open, I start judging people. It's like, oh, they look fake. 
they look like they're pretending. <laughs> it'll, but if I close my eyes, then I can be, I can listen and I feel close to God, you know? So I just have to work with my ability or my disability, however you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah, where that's I'm cool. at. Yeah. I wrote that. I wrote that thing, you know, thinking about like potentially if students, you know, came into a, in, a apprenticeship program and one of the requirements would be to go to church, like, what if you've never been to church before? Like, what should you pay attention to? What should you expect? And, um, and, and I think, cause you know, a lot of the like more modern things or whatever were reassuring to you. Like, uh, yeah. cause I mean, assuming they have all the, like the yeah, security I, 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 check-ins I can, have an app. and all that I can stuff. use an app yeah. and they print out stickers and then I, they check the code on my, child child sticker with the sticker i have and if that is an emergency there'll be a code flash up on a screen (laughs) during the service so yeah and so that's one thing it's like you know you you could debate about like the use of like the smoke machines and things like that but i mean i think you know that's a good that's a good technology that has advanced in those areas i wanted to go and like help write software for them but they don't have a team for people writing software i think they actually pay people to build the app like yeah i don't get to I don't get brands. to like help write software. It's like that's the team I want to be on. Well, yeah, I don't know those com- the different companies. Planning Center, I think, is one, and there's a couple other ones, but yeah. Well, that I, what I think is fascinating is this. Like, I mean, this wasn't an overnight story. You've been hanging around the TLC for like, over two years, three three years now. Yeah, I've been trying to be king for like two or three years. I can't get anyone to. <laughs> I can't get anyone to do what I want them to do. So I just, I just, say, well, what can I do? You know? <laughs> yeah. And you even went through an excommunication and everything. That's right. Else I got you, kicked out. You... <laughs> trying to tell people how they should run things and I get kicked out. <laughs> but you stuck around. Uh, man, I love that. Uh, well, that's because of people like Grim Grizz, you know, he, he's uh, been kind to me, you know, he's okay. He's the fringe of the fringe, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so that's probably the main reason I'm still around. Him and Jacob. Jacob invited me and tried to give me some work to do. So between Grim Grizz and Jacob, they uh, they helped. Grim Grizz, Jacob. Well, yeah, that's communion, right? To participate with him, and and then like, well, I think yeah. that, you know, and like to give him the glory. I get to I get to participate, but. I'm powerless to do it on my own. I have insufficient power. Yeah. You know, I don't have enough batteries. And my batteries are, the batteries I have, they're meant for me. I you have a choice. It. That's what you have. You have a choice. Uh, what, I have, what I have is a decision to make. And there's a difference between a resolve and a decision. A decision is backed up with action. You know what I'm saying? I could say I'm going to, oh, I'm, I'm suffering. I'm going to resolve to be different today. Right. But then I don't be different today. But the decision is, all right, I'm suffering. I can't do anything about it. I want to make a decision to do whatever I can to not to feel not live this way anymore. And then that that decision is followed by action. Period. Yeah. You know, because otherwise I'm just stuck in my resolves and my intentions. And it's just empty. You know, and that's where the insanity is because I'm over here trying to run on my own power. Meanwhile, all those mystical laws that we talked about, I can't, I have no defenses against those. They're already happening. You know, I'm over here trying to fight gravity, wondering why the fuck I can't get off the ground. It's interesting, like, when you're talking about, like, resentment and you're talking about self-love, like, like, it's, it, 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 like at first glance, that sounds right. Like self-love would be the solution to self-resentment or something, but it isn't like it actually, like, this is why a participation trophy is problematic is when you receive a participation trophy, you actually resent it because it's, it's, it's like you, you look, you, you have this trophy and, and, and you basically are like, this is, this is the only thing I could do is the free thing. Like I couldn't, like that, that like getting first place or, or even third place or even, even last, at least, at least gives, at least gave me a place, at least like, like this participant, it doesn't mean a damn thing. And like, and it creates a resentment. Like, it's why I think like, you don't, I like how you're saying like, you don't want to take the glory. I like that. But I also think like, 
you need to see you do it so that you can have self-respect. You can, you can respect your, and you don't necessarily, and that's different than glorifying yourself, right? Like it's different than thinking you're a great person or you know, you're, you're, you're fully aware that you're, you're a complete mess, but you're also able to have self-respect because you, because you are just a, simply a willing vessel. And right. then you get to watch yourself do it. And, and then as you do that respect develops and, and, and then you get to be someone that you like being. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you don't see yourself being somebody who you don't like being, so either way, you're going to be seeing something. So if you're going to have any say about it, clearly, if this isn't working over here, I got to do something different. And self-respect, I think self-respect comes from living in respect of what I know I'm capable of doing. I know I'm capable of screwing some shit up and destroying relationships and all this stuff. So I need to have respect for my ability to destroy. And yeah. the only way I do that is to do the opposite of that right and then i get to see myself doing something different right and like and that none of this is self-help so if anybody's thinking that this is self-help it's not this is about this is about self-surrender and self-abandonment right this is about making the cookies because the cookies are being made whether you like it or not i can sit over in the corner and say no i'm gonna make my own damn cookies good luck with that nobody's gonna eat them and they're gonna taste like shit anyways and you're going to be sitting there eating them like, oh, yeah, I really like my damn cookies. Yeah. And you're lying to everybody. And they're just bullshit cookies. You know? Um, there's something. That's good. Uh, that was really good. I like that. <laughs> I talked about the excluded middle. And, and this is very much what we're talking about here. And in missiological terms, when they would go to Africa or Asia or Latin America, many of these places outside of Christendom, you would have you would have a middle realm which were filled with these spirits entities so on and so forth the west believed well we didn't have that but we had a middle realm filmed filled with all sorts of other things and in a sense what hyper objects does is is begin to bring those things help us to see the middle realms in the west and now we're starting to understand a little bit of what the rest of the world saw. So, and I think John's intuition of using Plato's Republic of sort of, okay, scaling up, well, that's what the world had always done. The, 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 the fairies, the, the, the middle realm entities were like us, but not like us. And, and that's what we're, we're going to have to, in that way, sort of, it's sort of analogous to exaptation. You take you take something of our, you know, we already know how to, we have all this mechanism that we use to see with, and now when we close our eyes, we're going to use to imagine. And so this, I think, also is, is close to John Verveke's imaginal. And so we're going to use this to sort of, okay, how can we talk about the, the middle realm? And what I'm going to propose is something very similar is being argued for by Morton, the appearance on our individual and cultural radar of hyper objects is startling. He calls it a quake in being. But if we pursue it carefully, we come to realize that the hyper object, according to Morton, actually reveals properties of every object, of everything. And therefore, it, it, it demands from us a fundamental transformation in our relationship to all of being. Just let them be. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and I don't think that we can save people anyways. Like, there's a level of vanity to that that is absolutely so stupid. So, I don't know. What do you think? 